website. Okay, thanks very much, Susan. And You're we'll welcome. dive right in to our apps. Okay, I'm gonna do the first one because it's the oldest one um, from 2008. And it was developed by a computer guy, Mitchell Waite, an American computer programmer, author of programming books and publisher of mobile apps who worked with Steve Jobs on for the early apps for the iPhone. And it sells for $14.99 in the app store. When it first came out, and uh, I and a lot of my fellow birders at the time bought it, it was like a $5.99 or $6.99. Um, and I still use it. I, I do have Sibley on my phone, but I never, I, it's just one of those things where you, what you're comfortable with. So let me explain how it works. I still recommend it. Um, okay, so you enter the common name of the bird. So let's say I want the swamp sparrow. Okay, so then two things with swamp come up, purple swamp hen and swamp sparrow. Okay, I click, I put in, I click on the swamp sparrow and it comes up the pictures and their, their paintings, which are, emphasize the key characters. And then down here is a menu of general sounds, range, similar photos, feeders. I'll show all that. Um, I am really apt to only use the sounds. Um, I'm kind of old school and I have the books and, um, but I do enjoy using the sound. So I'm gonna play for you the sound of the Swamp Sparrow. It gives me um, options of, of this song, which we wouldn't hear in Florida because it's the winter bird. And then you can go down to the call, that chink. Okay. And it looks like it has the phonograms that show it if you know how to read those which I don't really. Okay, then it shows the range on an, another screen. And I guess you, you click down here to, to get to the range. And then some more key characters, picture of the flight. And then in the literature on iBird Pro, which they keep upgrading, they brag that they not, they're the only app that has both the, the paintings and photos. They have a whole collection of photos as well. And the last thing is that they have what's called Photo Sleuth. And it's an add-on that I did not get, um, but for another $4.99, you can put in your photo and it'll recognize it. Similarly to what Jack is gonna show you with, with the Merlin app. Um, so maybe sometime I'll try that, but as I said, I'm a little more old school and I really am only using this for the, for the sounds. iBird Pro. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, so we are not doing eBird tonight um, because we have a special program with Conservation Florida, but eBird is for most birders, our big go-to because we're recording sightings. So eBird is a project of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It began in 2002. It's one of the world's largest biodiversity related community citizen science projects. Um, shares, it stores observations, photos, recordings, and it can help you to find target birds, hotspots at any time of the year. And they keep making upgrades, so it's good. And you're gonna learn all about that on the 25th. Um, I highly recommend. So next slide, I have the date. Sorry. Sometimes and I while I'm going there, um, Kit had a, a question. Do you need an iPhone to get iBird? Um, no, no, it's just an app. You don't need an iPhone. Um, and we'll go, go back one. So anyways, um, eBird is very highly used. It's, it's my, probably the app I use the most um, because I want to record my sightings um, wherever. So we'll talk more about that on the 25th. One thing to point out, Kathy, is that people think it's an identification app. And right. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's a database. Right, it's, it's for data and either you looking at data or putting your own data in. Yes, 
definitely. And I remember back to the days before they didn't have the mobile and, you know, you have to keep your list and then put it on the computer at some other time. So it's really nice having it with you and it makes it more likely to record what you see. So let's go ahead. I'm going to talk about the Audubon Bird Guide. So um, this is, you'll see the um, Great Egret when you go to the App Store and it's free. So why not get it? And I've, I've had Audubon on my phone since um, I got a smartphone. Um, it's a great go-to. I do use Merlin as well, and Jack's going to talk all about Merlin, but Audubon has some really good features, and as I was getting ready for this presentation, I found some new ones that I'm actually going to try. So that's what you're going to look for on your um, app store, and like I said, it's free, um, so go ahead and go to the next one. So it gives you some options. So this is the front screen. Um, and as you can see at the top, you can set this up so you can record your sightings when you see them. Um, you can even um, have um, target birds that'll it'll alert you. And I haven't set that up yet because I do eBird and I feel like, oh my gosh, I'll be going crazy, but I might do that. Um, it has some conservation features. If you see that little green bar at the top, you can actually click on that and learn more about birds that are vulnerable to climate change. Um, and there's actually an, a link to link up with the Audubon.org um, website. But anyways, the main two things you see, you have two choices when you go to this, either to identify a bird or to search the guide. So I generally go search the guide, like if I'm looking for a particular bird, if I see something and I, you know, I look at Merlin and then I want to look at some other pictures just to, to get a variety because, you know, birds vary, right? So and all gonna look the same. You go to the next one. But this is how you search the guide. And you just simply would type in the first part of the name. Um, this is actually the very beginning of it. So it is not sorted by um, region or anything like that. Um, as you can see there, we might um, get lucky and see an Acadian flycatcher, but I don't think, and an alder, but I don't think we'd see anything else on that list. But it's a great way to quick look up another place to look for sounds, which I'm gonna show you, and maps and all that good stuff. So it's, it's really easy to use, I like it for that. Go ahead and go to the next one. So this is how to do bird ID, and it's different than Merlin. So, you know, sometimes you get really tricky birds and you can try Merlin, you can try iBird Pro, and sometimes I do both of those and see, do they agree? <laughs> But you can also come here. What I think is really cool is you can use filters. So maybe you just hear it. So you can filter for sound. Maybe you could, you could filter by habitat or the wing shape, tail shape, um, how it's acting, color. So it gives you a lot of options. And see, it does filter down for Florida. Mine automatically was on Florida. So if you go to another place, which I find birding apps are really, really good. If you go traveling and you're in a new place you don't really know, a lot about the area, like when we went to Puerto Rico, that was really helpful. All right, go to the next one. So, um, so if you were to filter by voice, if you just heard a bird, so here's the different filters, you, if, whether it's high sound, flute sound, whistle, buzz, or trill. And then as you filter down it, it lets you listen to the different birds. And I think that's a really nice feature because there are apps that you can record sound, but I, don't yet know of one that is really, really where we want it to be at, but they're working on it. Okay, go to the next one. And this is great, you know, how often, like the chat, you see the bird <laughs> from <laughs> the bottom up, it's way up high in a tree. So this is really helpful and it, it helps you to focus in on things too. You know, is the tail notched or square tip rounded? So you can filter by voice and then you can, you know, you can keep filtering down. Um, so, and I was like playing around with it. So I, I forgot what I had filtered for. I think long tail. So you see, you got the robin and the tree swallow there. Okay, next slide. And then, yeah, I was filtering for that. So whether you explore and you know you want to learn more about tree swallows or you're doing the, you know, identifying it, or you went to Merlin, and Merlin has some stuff, but on the, on the information, I think the Audubon app definitely has a lot more. And you see how you can add a sighting right there. You can even bookmark it if it's a favorite, you love this bird. 
So go ahead and go to the next one. They have nice photos. It has a great description. One thing I really like about Audubon, it gives you size. Um, because, you know, when you're out in the field and, and you're trying to figure out, well, you're looking at shorebirds and you're like, well, is it this one bigger than this one? So you get a size and that's very helpful. Okay, next one. And great range maps. Can you go to the next one? And this is really nice. So it is linked with eBird um, for current sighting. So I forgot I was looking at tree swallows and like the red would be more recent. Okay. And then you can click on those. You can go to the next one. And it actually names where it is. The only thing I don't like, um, it doesn't like give you directions. So you'd have to look it up else, elsewise, unless I haven't figured out quite how to do it. But I think that's really helpful. If you're looking for like the chat, you could put the chat in and see where it's been seen lately. Okay, next. I think we're about the end. And then um, it also will show you similar birds, which I think is really helpful. So if you see a bird that swallow like, and you want to see, well, what other things might look like a tree swallow? You can look at those. And so that is the Audubon Bird Guide. And I do recommend that if you have space on your phone, it's a great addition to your birding apps. All right, next. All right, that's me. Actually, Kathy, I had a quick question for you. Does yes. the information that you get on those sightings is, I'm assuming it's only for that app. So like you're not seeing eBird sightings on there. It's uh, probably. Yeah, right. Yes. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just, it was, it was I, a I curious think you're right. thing. I like where do they get that information from? Is it just through their, their app and their That's listing service? That's a good service? question. I don't know. That's a we'll really have to look question. into it. Like, yeah, I'm I'll like you. Answer while you guys are talking, uh, doing okay. your thing, I'll look into it. That's a great question. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I just don't know if it's different from the info that we all see on eBird. Is it a whole another plethora of information that none of us have thought about or looked into? Right. So. And perhaps but, because people do report their sightings, maybe some of those people don't do eBird. So it might be another place to look for sightings. Exactly. All right. Uh, so I'm going to do the Sibley app. Um, and I don't know if you saw that first slide. You don't have to go back to it, but it's rather expensive. It's uh, $19.99. Uh, I got it, I think when it was like $10, $9.99 a couple years ago. This second edition just came out, I think, in the last quarter of last year. You can go back. Deb, Backwards. You keep going. I'm sorry. This one? That's all right. Yeah, that's good. Um, but basically, the, the selling point for me on Sibley is obviously David Sibley is an amazing artist. Uh, and there's been tons of shows on him, but there's also his guides, which are great. And it's, um, he draws all of these birds and just an amazing artist. Uh, I actually prefer the real pictures a lot of times, but now I, I've been using this app a lot in the last couple of months. Um, and I don't really know the reason why, uh, I can give you a prime example is, um, we were looking for snow goose and I was trying to figure out the size. And so I was comparing it and I was going through and reading this like I would be reading a normal field guide at home. Um, and just the descriptions, the sounds, everything that they've got on here, but especially the length and the wingspan and the weight just kind of gives you an idea of the size of some of these birds that we get in Florida that we don't see all the time. So to, to me, it just gave me a little bit more info and I don't know, it, it increased my knowledge of what I was looking for and gave me a better idea. So, uh, and real quick, looking at the right-hand slide there, the um, if you look down there, it actually has a bar chart at the top. Um, and also that letter underneath is uncommon. I'm not sure, I took this off of their site and I'm not sure what location this is, but with this app, you can set it to the location. Um, you can also set it to the month, which is kind of cool. So. But for somebody like me, I get confused because we get so many passerines and different birds coming through our area at different times of the year, especially in the winter, just vagrants and stuff. So, but anyway, it does, does give you the bar chart on there that you've seen us use in some of our slides and it'll tell you if it's common or uncommon. Um, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so one of the coolest things too, especially when you're out in the field looking for sparrows is you can do, uh, similar birds 
And again, it's got these letters next to them on the left-hand slide that says whether it's, you know, very rare, uncommon, common, that kind of thing. So you can almost narrow down what you're looking at from that. But then if you click on one, if, if you look to the, to the right-hand side of that slide, there's a Lincoln Sparrow and a Savannah Sparrow. And it's hard to show you because of my technical, not very technical, but basically both of those birds, what you're looking at now, you can scroll either one of those and read more about it, see the flight picture, those kind of things. So it's, to me, side-by-side -side comparison on any bird when you're confused is the easiest way to go about it. So that's a really cool thing to have on your pocket. Um, you can go to the next slide. So like the rest of the apps, it does have the, uh, <clears throat> the range maps. Um, and again, if you look on the right hand side, it does have when you do that's an alphabetical list or actually that's taxonomic. Um, but you can see where it has uh, the uncommon, the common, scarce, rare, very rare or their codes. So again, that can help you um, kind of narrow down your choices if you're confused on a bird as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> So their smart search is really good. Um, and again, if you kind of look through this, I love that it has the, the month again, because with, you know, we do get a lot of vagrant birds here, but this should be able to narrow you down and get you pretty close to what you're probably going to see. So, but it, when you go through all these, you can see the arrow on the right hand side and it, um, you can click on those. And I just clicked on the tail as well. So you can see, and you can do this with all of these different adjectives. And so, you know, it should help you stream, streamline what you're trying to do and narrow it down to hopefully a close bird, but you know, it's all, it's all kind of a guessing game to some extent. Um, the, let me see, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> ah, one really cool thing is and it has this, I just pulled the duck one, but it has it for gulls. It has it for the passerines on the right. But a lot of times I'm sure, I don't think those of us on this chat are super technical in what we talk about, but for people that are and stuff that you see, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a really cool thing to know, especially if you're in the field with a really good birder and they say, oh, well the supercilium and this, and then you're like, what's the supercilium? But you don't want to sound like a dummy. You can look it up on your own and figure it out. And I kind of study these and try to figure out so that, you know, you're just a little bit more educated on it. But I thought it was a really cool thing that they actually have these as part of the app. Um, next slide, please. Oh, no, go back one, I guess. We'll, let me do one more thing. One other cool thing, and it's not on, uh, I don't have it on one of these pictures, but, uh, and at the end of it, it has, at the bottom of their information, it has the, uh, it has the bird banding code which is a four letter code that they use for all the birds. And I'm sure, you know, when I first started birding and still now I'm learning them every day. And when I started birding with people that knew what they were doing, they would text me like just the four letter code. <laughs> and I had no idea what they were talking about or they'd be like, you know, Modo at the gate. And I'm like, what does that even mean? You know? And so it's a cool thing when you're looking through, especially if I'm trying to tell somebody else and look like I know what I'm doing, I can look at the, the banding code at the bottom of that little list. So anyway, I, I, I like this app a lot. I've been using it a lot lately. I think it's really good. Um, and like Kathy said, eBird uh, for keeping track of what I do. Uh, but it, this allows you to, to list as well. Um, and the fact that it does do specific months and regions and that kind of thing. It's a good app. It's expensive. Um, but I think you can do like a trial thing. Just, you know, don't put your credit card in and try it out and see if you like it. But I think all of these apps, there's some free ones there that I think you can get what you need from it. So anyway, I like it. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Merlin. Merlin is free. Merlin is done by Cornell Lab, the same people that do eBird. In fact, Merlin uses the eBird data to predict based on your location. Uh, what you might be looking at. So I'm going to do a screen share. Um, and wow. 
You guys can see my phone? Good job. Okay. Um, so here's the application on my phone. And, um, and the reason why I'm circling this is because when you go to the app stores, uh, quite often, I mean, if you type in Merlin, there's a lot of the other apps that are similarly named. So I quite often go by the, uh, uh, by the picture they have, and this is the Cornell uh, lab, same photo there. So I'm going to open it. And let's start a, um, a bird ID. Oops, I can't click on the screen. Okay, so I think there's five questions here that they ask you. One is your location. And you can see previous locations that I've done and used. And I'm gonna go current location. And I keep clicking on the computer screen. And it defaults to today's date. So yeah, I'll use today's date and I'll hit the next button. And um, well, let's do a little bird. And you can pick three colors. So I'm gonna go eh, brown and white. And I'm gonna leave it at that. And I'm gonna go next. And this bird, I'm gonna say was eating on the ground. And I'm gonna go next. And it comes up with what it guesses using eBird. And this is in fact, what I've got a ton of at my feeders and on the ground is chipping sparrows. It also has, scroll down, it has things that are close to it or maybe not so close to it. Maybe, um, so I've used this a lot and now on the actual chipping sparrow, I can go to the right and we get different things. Like here's an immature one. Here's a picture of a juvenile. Here's a breeding adult and so on. Um, oops, I didn't want to do that. So, um, and here we go. So then I, I clicked and I got their, their run up on it and they have sounds you can play. I'll play its song, the song of its people. And I'm gonna go back and I slide through and there's uh, more photos you can look at. Brief description and click on the description, it opens that up. Now, if I wanna go back and do something else, I'm going to click on the home button, which is on the upper right here. So I'm gonna click home. And let's say I wanna do a photo ID and let's say I'm going to take a photo. So now my, my camera here's, here's my desk folks. Here's my uh, spirit animal. Uh, and boy, there we go. Um, let me pull up a photo of, uh, let's do this guy. And so here is a photo. I wanna get the idea, idea of, ID of, and let me move this out of the way. And I have learned that if I take the photo like this, the head's going to be chopped off. So I leave room at the top. And so now I'm going to hit the photo on my phone. And now it wants to know if I want to use that photo. And yes. And there we are. And even though I moved it down, it still chopped it. So let me close this photo so I can see. So now I wanna to try to get most of its head in there. If I use my thumb and pull the photo down, if I let go now, it just springs back to where it was. But if I move my thumb, use my thumb and move it down and then hit the next button. And then it wants to know, did I see this in Altamont Springs? Sure, today, sure. And you can change those things if you wanna do that. And I'll hit identify. And we got greater long legs, greater yellow legs. And again, you can, ah, 
you can scroll through the different views, um, different pictures it's got. And again, it's, it's pulling this data from eBird that what's being seen that looks like that and matching that. Very cool. And, uh, and then I'm gonna go home again. So I hit the upper right hand corner and I'm gonna do a, a, another photo ID. But this time I'm going to uh, take a photo from the back of one of my cameras. And let's not do that one. Let's do this one. Just bear with me here. And let's do this one. So, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit with the camera, but this one's, this one's got, this one's hiding. So we'll see what kind of a job it does. And there, and we'll take that photo. We're gonna use that photo. And now on the application of two fingers, I can crop in on that photo. So that's what I just did there. And when you do that with two fingers, it holds that crop. Whereas if you move it with one finger, it doesn't. And now I'm gonna go next and sure, this is in my backyard and it pulls up. Wilson Snipe. So we have that. Okay, I'm going to hit the home button again. This button up here, go back to where I started. And I'm going to go explore birds. And you can type in the name of the bird. Um, or if there's if it happens to be right there, like Fulvo's whistling duck, I can go right there. Um, I can scroll through various different photos of it, a brief description of it. Uh, a map of its location and sounds and there you have it. Um, I use Merlin a lot quite often the back of my camera I'll take a photo of something and I'm like not quite sure what it is and I'll use this to uh, get an idea. Uh, sometimes it gets stumped. Uh, last night I was playing with it and uh, used a uh, a photo of a great blue heron in its nest sitting on an, an egg or eggs and it's you see the head and the nest and I used Merlin and Merlin came back with black crown night heron. So uh, but that's Merlin and it's free and it's by the same people that do eBird and that's Cornell and um, there you go. Very good. And I need to stop sharing. Are we good? Okay. Let's see. I am next. Is that our last deck? One more. Okay. Here we go. All right. There you go. Susan? So I'm going to do seek. So if you, I. I don't see it. I'm just you seeing it. You have to share your does. screen again, Deb. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. There we go. All right. So I'm going to do iNaturalist and seek by iNaturalist. So iNaturalist did start, it was somebody's master's final project at UC Berkeley. Um, and then the California Academy of Science became interested because it was kind of a fun thing. And in 2017, National Geographic kind of joined in this initiative. They did come out in 2018 with a thing called SEEK, which is for children that also had support from our planet and the World Wildlife Federation in addition to National Geographic and Tangled Bank Studios. And I Naturalist and Seek kind of do everything. So you can do plants, you can do insects, you can do birds. Um, so they're more of a generalist thing, but sometimes when you're out in the field, it's kind of fun to say, hey, what's this? So let's go to the next thing. So both of them are free apps. You can use them on both Android and iPhone. 
Um, there is a review for the I Android app that the iNaturalist is a little bit buggy and clunky, and I have a, actually an Android and I will have to kind of agree with that. So iNaturalist is for 13 and up or parents approval because it does do online sharing um, and citizen oh. science. For Seek, there is no sharing unless you tie it to an iNaturalist account but they both use the iNaturalist data. The SEEK has no personal data collection unless you sign in with the iNaturalist. But it, um, the SEEK also at, is more of an identification and observation building. And because it's for children, you can earn badges to kind of make it interesting for them. So next. So iNaturalist is, um, best choice if you kind of want to share data you kind of want to do that citizen science you might want to discuss things with people um, you don't mind having your location identified mm -hmm. it does actually add to a by a data bank of biodiversity data that can be very helpful to different researchers seek then does a, you do not have to log in. It um, does use the information from iNaturalist um, and you do not have to have an internet connection. And unless you do the iNaturalist, you don't have to be 13 and over or parents permission. There is no personally identifiable information collected if you do not log into iNaturalist. So that's di the difference between Seek and iNaturalist. So next. So what it does is you're going to record observations. It does share it. You can discuss it. It does plants, insects, birds, mushrooms. There is a data bank of 50 million observations. iNaturalist does do a date, location, and time stamp and collect user data. All of this information is going on to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility which is kind of a worldwide um, bank for information that can be shared on the internet. And next. So this is kind of like the um, login pages. So the iNaturalist, you're going to log in Facebook, Google, email. I, you can kind of use it. I kind of did it without logging in. There is a skip button. Um, seek, you can either use iNaturalist or not, or continue without signing in to iNaturalist. And next. So the iNaturalist is on the left. This kind of has like a little, it kind of shows you what you've been seeing. The little plus button is what you're going to hit to search for. And on the seek, which is on the right, it's, you're going to use the camera button because basically for Seek, you're going to be taking all photos um, and looking at different things. So there is also little challenges because it is more geared to children to get a challenge, you know, different badges. So next. So on the Seek, it is going to be a war warning for children. Don't eat anything you find in the wild. <laughs> be aware of your surroundings. Respect living things. Um, you know, and if possible, you need adult supervision. So and you can just click. Um, actually, if you click the black, it goes away. So can, you can continue. So this is kind of what you're going to get. You take a picture. Let's say I took a picture of this bug. We did see this in Wakiva Springs. Um, and iNaturalist is going to say, hey, here's the genius, genus, genius, um, pick out, and it'll give you the suggestions. And you need to make sure you hit the check button, which I haven't always, because some of mine say unnamed. And, and that kind of identifies it. With Seek, it's just going to come up with the name, Southern Two-Striped Walking Stick. So I've taken a picture, those are the things, that's kind of how it's gonna look. Um, next. So they both kind of have a similar background. There is a bigger data bank in the iNaturalist and if you have something that you don't know what it is, they'll look at, you know, it discusses with different people. 
Um, but I think seek for the things I've looked at did fine. Like I looked up this scarlet bodied wasp moth, which was something I saw um, during the birding festival, North Shore birding festival. It will give you a little bit of information about it, um, a map of where it's located, the seasons, and talk to you a little bit about it. So, and they kind of are pretty similar between iNaturalist and Seek on this part of it. Um, next. So with Seek, you know, I, oh man, I saw three species, I get a cub badge. So it'll give you little badges as you see different things. So, and you can work on different challenges. So it is actually really good for getting kids interested because they might want to work on their insect badge or a, you know, amphibian badge. Okay, next. And that's it. Any questions about uh, Seek or iNaturalist? Put your questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and speak out if you like. And to go back to um, the Audubon Bird Guide, it is tied to eBird, the sightings. I don't know if additional sightings that are just made on the Audubon app go there. And when um, Jack was talking about Merlin, if you download eBird, Merlin is part of it. You will see, like if you type a bird in, you'll see the little Merlin thing. So if you're not sure, you can click right on that. Kathy, when you were talking about um, the app you were working on, which one did you do? Audubon Bird Guide. Yeah, you mentioned that you compared it with iBird for identifying. Did you ever use this photo sleuth? Yes, I did. How does that work? Um, I, I can't give it a full review. Um, I, I used, I, I was using Merlin and iBird Pro because I just downloaded iBird Pro. Merlin seemed to be a little bit more accurate, but mm -hmm. then it seemed like iBird Pro wasn't filtering for location. So it was giving me birds like far away <laughs> places, uh -huh. but Merlin was definitely filters down but it's not 100%. So when you do use those, know that you need to use your other guides and stuff to really be sure. Okay, thanks. Questions? Yeah, I think touching on that Merlin, you know, we I use it a lot, especially anybody that takes pictures. I think we use it like crazy and it is one of those kind of it can be spot on or it can be completely just baffling how it came up with that. Um, obviously the, uh, the quality of the photo, but again, you know, I use it as a ballpark kind of mechanism to, you know, and then Kathy, like you said, just go to your guides and all about birds and, you know, everything else that <laughs> you can find or muster and get help on trying to identify it. So Yeah, case in point, when we were looking for that goose and, and I photographed a goose right. where we were looking and Merlin called it a snow goose, but it was a tricky one because it was a hybrid. So that's the case that, and Merlin's one of those algorithms that it learns is the more that people do it and they, they mark, you know, this is my bird. It kind of learns from its mistakes. So it's, yeah, definitely not 100%. Did you ever get confirmation on that ID from mm -hmm. Gallus? Because he's the Lake County reviewer, isn't he? No, I I didn't. I well, I put it in as a as a hybrid. So. All right. Yeah, I just didn't know because I thought you said it could be another hybrid, and because yeah. I liked it, it looked like a what a swan goose and a Canada yeah. goose. Yes. That's why I agree with that, but. What do I know? <laughs> oh, and, and see, Marty mentions um, the Warbler Guide. Yeah, the Warbler Guide. I don't know who may. I have the Warbler Guide, and I. That's another one that costs, but it's good. It shows.